Now we're really getting down to something because it's in this 18th dynasty, in fact, the wealthiest dynasty probably in all of ancient Egyptian history, where we're going to see major events in the Bible play out. Moses and Aaron confronting Pharaoh, the Exodus and so on. Who was the Pharaoh that Moses was interacting with? Yeah, these, these are the big ticket items. This is the most ancient text we have describing the nation of Israel. And guess where it is? It's in Egypt, where they say there's no evidence for any Israeli or Hebrew history there. It seems so clear that there is evidence. Why do we find that there are experts that are denying this as evidence? The whole foundation of Judeo-Christian belief is tied to the history of Egypt and the Exodus. But the experts say there's no evidence for the Hebrews in Egypt. Gary, you have written and researched extensively on this topic. You've even led tours in Egypt. What do you say? Is there evidence? Yeah, I wouldn't say there is no evidence. There is evidence if you know what to look for. So the reality is that experts and archaeologists today, they don't accept the Bible's history to start with. But actually, if you start with the Bible's history and try to look at ancient Egyptian culture, you'll see gobs of evidence. So it's a bit disingenuous when the experts say there is no evidence. So the reality is they start from a view that the Bible is not an accurate history book. They don't believe the Bible to start with. But if you actually start with scripture and look at the insights scripture gives us about ancient Egyptian history, you can start to figure out a time and a place where the ancient Hebrews uh, were. And the simple fact is, if you understand ancient Egyptian culture, how they thought their religious practices, you would not expect to see a slave class of people mentioned on their tombs, which are deifying the pharaohs and the gods. So this nation of Egyptians, they were quite different to everyone else around them. What are some of those differences, Gary, and, and why is it important to know that? Well... I kind of called them planet Egypt because the ancient Egyptians were, were doing things, building things, uh, unlike any other nation on the planet at that stage. Uh, they were certainly different. They were obsessed with the afterlife. That's why we have so much stuff left from ancient Egypt. You know, the pyramids were basically giant tombs. After the pyramids, they built into the Valley of the Kings, cutting these massive tombs into the side of of hills and mountains. And the whole object there was to deify the Pharaoh. Ancient Egyptian religion has many gods and all of those gods were gods of nature. You know, there was a god of the sky. They even had a crocodile god and a hippo god. So think about this. When God wrought the 10 plagues upon Egypt, they were plagues against nature, plagues of gnats and frogs, and he turned the Nile to blood. Now, why was that? Well, the Pharaoh was a living representative of those gods. His job was to maintain something they called mart, which was balance and justice. And it was pretty easy for him to do because the reason Egypt was so wealthy was the Nile. Every year the Nile used to flood. It used to bring these life-giving silts from Upper Nile in Central Africa, these silts would be deposited on the banks of the Nile and they would plant. They only had three seasons, flood, planting, and then reaping. And so when you can feed a population as well as they could, you can get a large population very, very quickly to build all these incredible monuments. It also gives us an indication in the Bible, whenever there was famine in the land, where did they go? Hey, let's go down to Egypt. So they had the Nile, that was really the centre of everything, and it's also what gave them their wealth. Mm, okay. And so can you give us a bit of a perspective then of the Egyptian chronology and how that's framed? Yeah, so the dynastic system that we have today was compiled by an Egyptian priest called Manetho. And he was living in, uh, it was around about 322 BC, I think, at the time of the Greek occupation of Egypt. Alexander the Great came in, he conquered Egypt, one of his generals, Ptolemy, took over. And so Manetho was commissioned to write 
a history of ancient Egypt. And kind of here's how it goes. You've got the old kingdom. Now, a kingdom period is when a monarch ruled over all of Egypt, upper Egypt and lower Egypt. So, for example, the fourth dynasty, those great pyramids we have at Giza, uh, that's in the old kingdom. Now, it's a belief that that great pyramid building bankrupted the economy. And so you can then go into what's called an intermediate period. And these local governors and viziers set themselves up as pharaoh. There was not national rule. Then we have the Middle Kingdom. So this was a very short period when a king, a succession of kings ruled over Egypt. And that declined. And when that declined, there are records of a Semite people. So that's from the Levant, uh, what we might call even Canaan today, migrating to Egypt. Okay, and eventually they took over and ruled Egypt, and they were a group of people known as the Hyksos, rulers of foreign lands. And during that second intermediate period of the Hyksos, they relegated the nation, uh, the, the the Egyptians themselves, to central Egypt, Thebes or Luxor, and they were virtually prisoners in their own land. Eventually, the Hyksos were expelled, and then we have the wealthiest period in all of ancient Egypt, the New Kingdom. And then after that, there's a third intermediate period, a late period. The Persians come in and conquer Egypt. And then we get to Alexander the Great and the Ptolemies. And of course, one of the most famous Ptolemaic pharaohs we've all heard of was Cleopatra. Actually, Cleopatra VII was the last pharaoh of Egypt before uh, the Romans conquered and took it over. And so we get this framework from Manetho, who you've mentioned. Yes, so he tried to compile a dynastic system, a dynasty kind of being a family line. And when no son was born to inherit the throne, it, the next pharaoh may have been a governor or a general in an army or something like that. A good example of that is Tutankhamun, the famous pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. He didn't have any children. And so eventually the uh, succession was passed on to one of his generals. But here's something interesting, Jess. We look at Manetho, and he's an ancient historian that was referred to by others. But when he was writing about the beginnings of ancient Egypt, in fact, he was closer to the moon landings than he was to the beginnings of ancient Egyptian history. That's how long ancient Egyptian history has gone for. Okay, so we've got this time frame now. How do we know when the Hebrews were in Egypt? Well, remember I said the Egyptians are not going to mention them. Uh, I mean, why are you going to mention a group of slaves on your tomb? It would be like my family putting my mortal enemy's name on my, my own tombstone, right? <laughs> it's not going to happen. But again, the Bible gives us some insights, and I'm, I'm going to need to refer to some passages of Scripture here because I believe the Hebrews were there. Joseph eventually came down and he encountered a Hyksos pharaoh, a non-Egyptian pharaoh. And if you remember, I said they were ruling Egypt and had subjugated the native Egyptians themselves to central Egypt. So I was reading the Bible one day and, you know, the story of Joseph is, in fact, my favourite story in the Bible. As a young Christian, I read it lots and lots because it's about forgiveness and redemption. But after I started to study Egyptian history, I was reading one of these, these passages again and this literally leapt out of the pages of the Bible for me, and I was so excited. So we know the story. Uh, Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. He was taken down to Egypt, and he served in Potiphar's house as a servant. So uh, let's read this, for example, in Genesis 39, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian had brought him from the Ishmaelites who brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, that's just one passage. Whenever Potiphar is mentioned in Scripture, it's Potiphar the Egyptian, Potiphar the Egyptian. And I thought, well, isn't that a little redundant? I mean, he's in Egypt to start with. Why would you keep referring to him as an Egyptian? Yeah. Well, we know eventually Joseph was put in prison and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. So when he's brought out and he correctly interprets Pharaoh's dream, this is in Genesis 41, Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? And by the way, let me just stop there. Mm. So you've got this Pharaoh in Egypt and the word God is Yahweh. But hang on, 
Egyptians don't recognize Yahweh. They've got their own gods. But if the Pharaoh was a Hyksos, he's a Semite, right? He would probably believe in some sort of monotheistic uh, religion. Um, Pharaoh basically is eventually going to give the best of the land to the Hebrews, etc. So Pharaoh is lording this foreign god. This does not make sense if Pharaoh is an Egyptian. And then we have the reconciliation when Jacob comes down with the rest of his sons and Joseph is reconciled to his brothers. Fascinating passage here. Joseph says to his brothers, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brother and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for they've been keepers of livestock and they brought their flocks and herds and all that they have. And Joseph says to his brothers, when Pharaoh calls to you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Hang on. If this Pharaoh is an Egyptian, why is Joseph saying to his brothers, tell Pharaoh your shepherders because shepherders are an abomination? Aren't they shooting themselves in the foot here? Exactly. But we have this record in Egyptian history of these Hyksos, Semite immigrants, migrating to Egypt. They're bringing their goats. They're bringing their sheep. They were shepherders. And later, Pharaoh then says, and if any good men amongst you, let him look after my flocks. So, so he has flocks. So he has flocks. But hang on, shepherders are an abomination to an Egyptian. So scripture gives us an indication um, here as to the nature of the Pharaoh. And I believe it's clearly Pharaoh himself is not an Egyptian. Mm, this is really significant. <laughs> well, you can understand why I said it leapt off the page. And beautifully, this is going to fit a revised chronology because eventually what happens is um, the Hebrews are enslaved by a subsequent Pharaoh. Mm, so that's what I was going to say next. When, when were they enslaved? Well, at... The capital of the Hyksos reign, it's a city known as um, Avaris in the northern delta region. And archaeological excavations have shown there that there seemed to be a group of people that were living under special status under the Pharaoh. Now, the scripture tells us that Pharaoh gave Joseph and his family the best of the land. But do you remember what I said about Pharaoh? He's a representative between the gods, the gods of nature and the people and Pharaoh's giving away his blessed land to foreigners. Mm. Unthinkable. Another indication that he's not an Egyptian. But in Egyptian history, we know that the Hyksos were eventually expelled. There's a Pharaoh called Sekenre Tau in the 17th dynasty. This is in the second intermediate period. He tried to expel the Hyksos. In fact, you can see his mummy in the uh, Museum of Civilization in Egypt. He's got these axe wounds in his head. His body apparently was left on the battlefield for a couple of days, and so it was in bad condition before they retrieved it and mummified it. So he didn't throw the Hyksos out. His son, Carmos, and all these names are going to be quite confronting and hard to remember, but Carmos tried to evict the Hyksos. That didn't work. Then we have the end of the 17th dynasty. Amos, brother of Carmos, founds the, what is the 18th dynasty, and he eventually expels the Hyksos. And I believe this is a fulfillment of that passage in Exodus 1.8 that says, there now arose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Right? Amos was the one to expel the Hyksos. Didn't know Joseph. So ha Joseph was like the saviour of Egypt. How could someone, how could a pharaoh not know? This makes sense of a baffling passage. Uh, it troubled me for years because if a, in a dynastic line, if a son is inheriting his father's throne, how could you get a son that suddenly doesn't recognise these people that, you know, were, were living under his father's special status, supposedly? But... If a native Egyptian pharaoh arose, expelled the Hyksos, what does he find? He finds a people living in his blessed land. You know, they would regard them almost like parasites, etc. And so I believe, again, that the pharaoh that arose, who did not know Joseph, was 
what Manetho recorded as the first king of the 18th dynasty, a king named Amos. And now we're really getting down to something because it's in this 18th dynasty, in fact, the wealthiest dynasty probably in all of that ancient Egyptian history, where we're going to see major events in the Bible play out. Moses and Aaron confronting Pharaoh, the Exodus and so on. So is this the time that we're actually looking for the Exodus? Yes. So when I gave that outline of Egyptian history and I said there was the new kingdom, this is the wealthiest, uh, we've got all the archaeology. We, we've, we found all the tombs of the pharaohs in the 18th dynasty. And so this period of ancient Egyptian history, in terms of the times attributed, the chronology, we believe is pretty accurate to within a few tens of years, going right up to the end of the Ptolemies and the Romans. And so scripture actually gives us the date of the Exodus. And I'll tell you how we can work it out because in 1 Kings 6 verse 1, it says, in the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, that's the Exodus, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Well, simply put, we know when Solomon began to uh, build the temple, and this would put the date of the Exodus around about 1446 or 1445 BC. This puts it smack in the middle of the 18th dynasty. And remember, we only got a few tens of years of wiggle room here. So then we've got to look at the characters again from scripture to see whether we can find a Pharaoh or more that fits who the description who Moses uh, interacted with. Mm, yep. So let's get on to Moses. We um, often hear this question when we're talking about Egypt um, and the biblical account, who was the Pharaoh that Moses was interacting with. Yeah, these, these are the big ticket items everywhere you go. Who was the Pharaoh of Joseph's time? Who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Mm. So I'm going to need to refer to quite a few passages here so we can get that picture. Uh, the sixth Pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, remember Amos was the first one. He expelled the Hyksos. The sixth Pharaoh comes along. Uh, his name is Tut Moses III. And he's often called the Napoleon of Egypt. Actually, I think it's it's quite unfair because he obviously preceded Napoleon. Might be better if Napoleon was called the, the Toot Moses of France or something like that. But the reason I mention that is he changed Egyptian foreign policy. He started to go into the Levant, into the land of Canaan and conquer these cities. And these cities were now paying tribute back to Egypt. And this is why it made them the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. And the other thing uh, about Toot Moses, he recognised that allowing immigrants to come into the land and eventually grow in number was what led to their decline in the Hyksos rule. So he's changing foreign policy and saying, no longer are we going to be wait, you know, wait to have this happen to us again. We're going to conquer these nations and they're going to be, you know, paying tribute to Egypt. And that's what uh, exactly what happened. So around about that time, there's a queen, a princess uh, called Hatshepsut. She was, there weren't many uh, female pharaohs in Egypt. And I believe she's the one who drew Moses out of the Nile. She actually would have been the stepmother of Tutmosis III. So Tutmosis III and Moses probably were like half brothers at that time. Now, we know the story, Moses kills an Egyptian. And then scripture tells us that Pharaoh tried to kill Moses. Moses flees Egypt and he goes to live in the Midian. And then amazingly, in the New Testament, uh, the disciple Stephen, and he's addressed to the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts, he refers to Moses. And it says, after 40 years in the wilderness, God speaks to him and says, go back to Egypt for those who tried to kill you are now dead. He also says that Moses was trained in all the ways of the Egyptian. So putting that together, he's found by an Egyptian princess, probably Hatshepsut, raised in the royal household. He's the half-brother of Tut Moses. Tut Moses tries to kill him, and after 40 years, Moses comes back. So we've got to find a pharaoh who at least reigned for 40 years. 
two, Moses III reigned for 54 years. In fact, the whole of the new kingdom, there are only two pharaohs who reigned for more than say, four years. I was going to say, is there any other options? O- really. Only one other, mm. and he's 200 years too late. Okay. So then we know the 10th plague came upon Egypt. And God says in that 10th plague, he's going to kill all the firstborn of the land, including the son of the pharaoh. So if Tutmosis III is the one who tried to kill Moses, right, he's dead when they come back, he's going to have to encounter not a firstborn son because if that pharaoh of the Exodus was a firstborn son, he would have eventually died in the 10th plague. Yeah. So we've got to have a 40-year reigning pharaoh, not a firstborn son inherit the throne, and guess what? Tutmosis III's second-born son, a pharaoh by the name of Amenhotep II, inherited the throne. Tick, tick, tick. Ah, but wait, there's more. (laughs) So when the exodus occurs and God kills the firstborn sons in Egypt, the pharaoh himself doesn't die, Amenhotep II, not a firstborn son. But what about his son? Well, guess what? His second-born son, or at least we know not a firstborn son, inherited the throne. This is a pharaoh known as Tutmosis IV. And in fact, everybody knows the great sphinx on the Giza Plateau. There's a stella between the paws of the sphinx. And that's how we know that Tutmosis IV is not the firstborn son of Amenhotep II. What's a stella, Gary? A stella is a basically a monumental inscription made out of stone. Mm-hmm. They chiseled their words on it. So basically, it's a slab of stone uh, that is an inscription. 40-year reigning king at least, not a firstborn son inherits, not a firstborn son inherits. And guess what? This all happens round about the time in Egypt of the biblical date of the Exodus. So this looks like we have the Pharaoh of the Exodus then. Amenhotep II. There's something very interesting about him. Tutmosis III, I mentioned he was a Napoleon of Egypt. He conducted 17... Um, excursions into the Levant. And whenever they went conquering these other nations, they used to bring back lots of bounty. And they would record their treasures on a wall at Karnak Temple in Luxor. And funny enough, Jess, it's called the Booty List. That's literally the archaeological and expert (laughs) name for it. And on the Booty List, it says, um, to Moses III, he brought back so much gold and so many you know, chests of acacia wood and so on. And he brought back 2,207 prisoners. But his son, who I believe to be the pharaoh of the Exodus, Amenhotep II, he only conducted two excursions into the Levant. And what did he bring back? 101,000 prisoners. Oh, a lot more. Yeah, why? Maybe trying to restore the loss of a slave base. Because what happened in the Exodus? We lose all the all slaves. Those slaves. Yes, mm. yes, and their job was to bake, basically build mud bricks. That's what scripture tells us. Mm-hmm. When you go to Egypt today, there are mud bricks everywhere. Really, everywhere. Some of the walls surrounding temples are twenty over twenty feet thick. Imagine that, f- thick of mud bricks to keep the flood waters of the Niles out of the temple. So, yeah, brick mud brick making was a pretty uh, intensive and very important job. It must be pretty fascinating to go there and actually see it and be able to see and touch those mud bricks. Yes, it is. You know what's more fascinating? What we've laid out, these characters, Toot Moses the third, the one that tried to kill Moses, Amenhotep the second, you can see their mummies today in the Museum of Civilization. Wow. And I, I have to say, even saying it now, <laughs> the hairs on my neck stand up that I look at Amenhotep the second, his his body lying there, and I think Moses and Aaron could have stood before this man, he's there. And yet what's more fascinating, Jess, is after this period, okay, so I mentioned the Egyptians themselves are not going to mention the Hebrew nations. It's an affront to their gods. It's an affront to the Pharaoh. But after this biblical date of the Exodus and where we put that in the Egyptian chronology, we start to actually see the Hebrews and, and, um, and Israel mentioned in Egyptian records for the very, very first time. Evidence is starting to appear. How come now? Well, the great-grandson of the pharaoh of the Exodus was a pharaoh called, originally called Amenhotep. Amun was the main deity of Egypt. And 
he changed his name. Amenhotep IV, he changed it to Akhenaten. Now, the Aten was a sun disk, and people say he starts to create what is a monotheistic religion. When you go to Egypt, you see these great statues of Pharaoh, flail in one hand and, and you know, always in this classic pose. But Atanatan depicts himself sitting there with his children playing on his lap. He's kissing them. His wife was the famous Nefertiti, who we've all heard of, the famous bust that's in the Berlin Museum. And Akhenaten is writing love songs. They call them psalms to the Aten. And they're almost like psalms of David in the way he's trying to now have a relationship with a single deity. Well, if he's the great grandson of the Pharaoh of the Exodus, that time is not too far away. And so Akhenaten was regarded as a heretic. In fact, he believed in what he was doing so much that capital Thebes, where the temple of Karnak is and was the capital of Egypt, he abandoned it. He went further uh, downstream towards the source of the Nile and built a brand new city called Akhetaten, the horizon of the Aten. But when he died, subsequent pharaohs erased all that. They took his building blocks and they regard him as a heretic. This cannot be understated what he did. You've got nearly a thousand years of a continuous system of religious and economic uh, systems that are tied together in ancient Egypt. And this guy comes along and abandons it all. Just changes it. And so he was regarded as the heretic of Egypt. Monotheism, that's unusual. Where did he get that idea from, maybe? Well, everyone thought it was Akhenaten, but in the last couple of years, one of the most exciting finds in all of ancient Egypt, in fact, the press described it as mm. the most significant find since Tutankhamun's tomb, and this was a city built by Akhenaten's father, okay, called the Dazzling Aten, the city of the Aten, okay? And uh, or it's all sometimes called the Golden City. So it shows that the elevation of the sun disk, the Aten, was not started by Akhenaten, but his father, Amenhotep III. And he is the grandson of the, what we believe to be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So now you're getting closer to those dates. So was some of that legacy passed on from Amenhotep to his son. Now, this period is called the Amarna period because when Akhenaten, Akhenaten built that city, Akhenaten, mm. as it gets confusing, yeah. it's called, he built it at a place called Tel Amarna. And during their reigns, we've got tablets. These are cuneiform tablets, which are clay tablets with a, a systematic form of writing. And these tablets are letters from these vassal states. Remember that Tutmosis III set up in Canaan? that were paying tribute, and they're writing back to Amenhotep III and his son, and listen to what they're saying. The lands that your fathers joined together have been separated by the Aparu, or sometimes it's the Habaru. What does Habaru sound like? Hebrew. <laughs> Aha. Now, Habaru is actually a, not a nice term. It kind of means vagabond, wanderer, nomad. Mm -hmm. And it's what we call a paranomasia. In other words, it's a punning term mm. that you might use as a nickname for somebody. It might sound like them, oh, but we can also call them, you know, describe them in a derogatory term. Mm. And there are over 200 or more of these letters describing all of these lands that were under Egyptian rule being taken over by these groups called, or this group called the Aparu or the Habaru. And what does Amenhotep do about it or his son Akhenaten? Nothing. They allow all those lands to be taken by these Habaru, even though they were paying wealth back to Egypt. My view is they've got a pretty good idea of what the Hebrew God did in Egypt, and they're not going back. They're not going there to confront uh, them. I see. Anymore. So they've got knowledge. They can remember what happened. And that's affecting the decisions that they're going to make. Exactly. Interesting. Can we go and see these tablets? Yes, you can. They're in the Egyptian Museum and you can even type Amarna letters yep. online and you can see some of the descriptions from these vassal kings talking about these groups conquering their lands. Quite amazing. And you can even go to some of those cities, their tells, their hills uh, in Israel 
today. So we're mentioning some of the evidence for the Hebrews actually being there. Is there anything else we haven't mentioned? There's a temple in Sudan. This is uh, a couple of countries south of Egypt, modern day Sudan. And there's a temple there and they found an inscription called the Soleb inscription. And this inscription, which was built at the time of Amenhotep III, remember he's the grandson of the Exodus Pharaoh and the father of Akhenaten. And this description talks about the nomads of Yahweh, right? So yes, when these vassal states were riding back to Egypt, this is during what we call the conquest period. This is the time when Joshua and the Hebrews are entering Canaan and conquering these cities. And here we have Amenhotep III, remember the grandson of the Pharaoh of the Exodus, the one who built the big golden city to the Aten. He's describing them as the nomads of Yahweh. This is the first time in non-biblical texts anywhere in ancient history that we have Yahweh actually mentioned. Mm. Now, a little bit after this, okay, remember I mentioned Tutankhamun and he gave his throne, well he didn't, but his throne was given to Horam Heb, his general. That was the end of the 18th dynasty. Then begins the 19th dynasty as Manetho recorded it. The third king of the 19th dynasty is one of the most famous kings in Egypt, Ramses II or Ramses the Great. I call him the Hollywood Ramses because he's the one that uh, when you watch the movie with Yul Brynner, that Moses and Aaron encounter. It's, it's wrong by our view. But Ramses II's son is a pharaoh called uh, Meren Ptah. Looks like Menepta when you look at it, so don't correct me for a wrong pronunciation. The Egyptians would have pronounced it Meren Ptah. But he, constru he constructed a huge stella, and it's sometimes described as the Israel stella because there's a little piece right at the bottom there where he mentions the nation of Israel. And this is the first mention of Israel act actually as a nation in all of ancient history. And this is in hieroglyphics? That it's in hieroglyphics, yes. He's boasting about his victory over, over Israel. You've got to remember, uh, we don't even know whether that's true because the pharaohs never lost a battle <laughs> as recorded on their monuments. They were I mean, gods can't lose a battle. Right. So he's talking about a victory over Israel. But this is now telling us that the land of Canaan has now been settled and is a nation of Israel in its own right. Remember the dynasty before, they were described as nomads or the Habaru, but now we've got them as a nation in the land. And this is the most ancient text we have describing the nation of Israel. And guess where it is? It's in Egypt where they say there's no evidence for any, any Israeli or Hebrew history there. Gary, it seems so clear that there is evidence. Um, why is this seeming like it's being ignored or um, why, why do we find that there are experts that are denying this as evidence? Well, as we've been doing this series, Jess, there are only two games in town when it comes to creation and the Bible's history, right? Either creation is true or evolution is true. And of course, if evolution is true, what's left? That's a no-go for some people. And in the same way here, what we're talking about is the accuracy of the Bible's history. Right here, all of these details. And look, we've only just scratched the surface. There is so much more we could look at. But that's very, very confronting for people. Are you telling me the Hebrews really were in Egypt? Are you telling me that 12 tribes exited from Egypt and that the Bible says from one of those tribes, the tribe of Judah, the Messiah would eventually come? Yeah, for some, the reality is that's, that's a no-go. But for us as Christians, we can take comfort of the reliability and the authenticity of Scripture. Just some of those details I mentioned before about the nature of the Pharaoh in Joseph's time are quite astounding when we know what to look for. So why are all these facts not counted as evidence for the Hebrews being in Egypt? Well, again, just to repeat, they don't start with the Bible for one, but to quote Indiana Jones from the Raiders of the Lost Ark, they're looking in the wrong time. So you recall I mentioned the Hyksos capital, the second intermediate period, uh, it was called Avaris. 
the Hebrews were probably living there under special status under a non-Egyptian pharaoh. So it looks like there was this Hebrew settlement in Avaris. Okay, now if you ask archaeologists, they'll say, well, this can't be the Hebrews because the Bible says that the Hebrews were enslaved, building mud bricks and building the storehouses of Python and Ramses. Well, the first Ramesside king doesn't come along until 200 years later in the 19th dynasty. That's 200 years late for the biblical date of the Exodus. But what we're dealing with here, Jess, is something uh, known as textual updating. So ancient scribes, you know, they were like human photocopiers recording ancient scriptures, ancient texts. But what would happen is often they would update name places so that the people, the readers of their day would understand what they were referring to. And actually Ramses II, remember I mentioned he was the third king of the 19th dynasty, he actually came along later and he built over and expanded the Hyksos capital, which was called Avaris, and it became the city of Ramses, Per Ramses, in other words, the house of Ramses. So later when scribes were recording this history in the Bible, they were calling the place the city of Ramses because that's what it would have been in their day. Now, that might be a little confronting to Christians. Oh, our Bible's changed. Well, remember, we only have copies and the first things that would be changed are name places. Let me give another example. Mm. So the 12 tribes came out of Egypt and conquered the land of Canaan. One of those sons, when the land was broken up, was called Dan. All right. But long, long before the exodus ever occurred, Abraham is pursuing Lot's captors and scripture says he pursued them to the land of Dan. Well, how could he be pursuing them to the land of Dan before the exodus has even taken place and the Hebrews have conquered that land and divided up the land? Mm -hmm. So again, there's an example where scribes are updating the texts so readers know what region Abraham was pursuing Lot's captors to. And that's what we're dealing with here. The Hyksos capital of Avaris, where the Hebrews would have lived around and near under special status, was later built over by Ramses II and called Ramses. I wonder if any of these experts has heard that explanation before and um, understood the concept of textual updating, what they would say to that. Well, some of them have, uh, but again, um, they might just say, well, the Bible's fairly accurate when it comes to some parts of history, but is it a divine book inspired by the creator himself? That's where they would fall short. So are you saying, Gary, that because of their worldview, it seems that they are discounting clear evidence that doesn't fit with that worldview? Yeah, well, remember when I started, you're not going to see mentions of Hebrews on Egyptian tombs. But if you start with the Bible, then you start to know what to look for. You get those insights from Scripture about the characters. And the amazing thing is, Jess, the Egyptians have left this amazing record of their pharaohs and how long they reigned. And we can take that and look at the Bible's history. But as I mentioned, that's going to be pretty confronting for some when they discount the Bible's history to start with. But you know what's exciting? You mentioned that we've led tours there and I can talk to the local Egyptian guides who are not Christians and I sit about this revised chronology and they know these people, Hatshepsut, they know Toot Moses and I try to flesh it out in terms of what the Bible says about them and I've yet to be re re rejected by them. And they turn around and say things like, that makes perfect sense. So these are people without the same kind of background, not necessarily looking for it. But it's because they don't know what to look for if they've never read the Bible to start with. Gary, thank you so much for helping us understand so much of Egyptian history. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs>